Hello and welcome to Thread Talks. I've got the incredible Ravinda Vogel on the brow sofa. I've been trying to get her for a while. I love her writing, I'm addicted to her FT column where she turns food into poetry. Uh, and she's also got the most wonderful restaurant, Giacconi, uh, in Marylebone. If you haven't been there, you need to go and visit. Uh, Ravinda Vogel, welcome. It's so lovely to be on your couch. Thank you for having me. I'm just so excited that I met you. I feel like I know you, but yeah, uh, I do. But I would love. Uh, to find out more about your journey because I think of you as a writer strangely more than a chef but you're actually equally it, it, it's an equal proportion that you know you're both yeah. really aren't I you? mean I think I, I also think of myself as a writer first and as a chef second um, you know I started off as a writer so I, I studied uh, English and then I did a postgrad in journalism I always knew I wanted to write I did a little stint in PR and I thought there's something wrong because the part of this I'm enjoying the most is writing press releases so then I knew that you know magazines were kind of my calling in papers and I, I ended up working on a fashion and beauty department for a magazine and then went into beauty journalism. That's so interesting so you, so you did Fashion and beauty first. Yeah, yeah, fashion and beauty first. And then I was always that sort of girl who was um, bringing food in that I cooked at the weekends. And, you know, on a fashion magazine, you're everybody's like kind of diet nightmare. Um, and a really dear friend of mine who was a stylist um, had seen an advert for a TV show where they were looking for a new female TV cook. And she she had this amazing kind of cosmic psychic ability and she'd been quite right about lots of things and she said, I just have this overwhelming feeling that if you enter this competition you're going to win and it's going to change your life. And she was absolutely right because 9,000 women entered and I oh, ended up winning. Wow. Um, Did you know that you, you know, you obviously grew up cooking yeah. and loved it. Did you know that this was something that could be celebrated you know, on a bigger scale? I had The parameter that I had been given by my mother was that you will cook for your husband and your children. And I never even knew that you could train to be a chef. I never even dreamed that I could. And I think it was watching, uh, actually I remember this very distinctly, this moment in time. I was 18 years old, I was working at Selfridges um, I was working on a beauty counter and with my, you know, meager salary, I bought Nigella Lawson's um, How to Eat. And I used to live in Kent and I would read it on the train journeys home. And that was such a beautiful thing because firstly it was food, which I loved, but it was her writing that mm. I found so completely compelling. And it was honestly like that moment where someone has let light and air in. And I think that was my first kind of glint of inspiration of, hmm, this could be something else. And I sort of continued, I think, through my life, subconsciously dreaming about cooking for people. Um, and, and I think when you've kind of, I almost manifested it, I think. So even when I was doing the show, although it was completely, I didn't think I was going to win it or I had no expectations. But when I did, I was sort of surprised, but I wasn't completely shocked because I felt like it was a moment that I had created for myself and I was just stepping into it. And I remember going back to my editor and saying, oh, you know that thing I took the day off for? Well, I, I sort of won. And she I said, to, she said to me, wow, well, we're going to lose you. I mean, this is huge. And I was so sort of unaware of what that opportunity meant. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Of course not. No. And I went back to my job. And then the day that the show aired, I started getting calls from agents saying, you may have a career doing this. And um, I ended up seeing about eight or nine agents. And I was so skeptical as a you know, as a journalist, I think you you just generally are. And people were saying things like, oh, we could make you the face of Vesta Curries or something. I don't want to be the face of Vesta yeah. Curries. And I wasn't interested until I went to the last agency and they had a literary side. And I'd write, been writing this sort of scrappy little cookbook for myself, really to record my life and the recipes that I, I like cooking, never thinking I'd have it published. And um, I was sort of introduced to this amazing woman called Felicity Blunt. 
and uh, oh, we all know she, Felicity Blunt is yeah, she's sister she, of Emily. <laughs> she's amazing, um, and she just took one look at the manuscript and she just said, "I really love your voice. Like this is so fresh. It's so unusual." and I would love to sign with you, and we did. And then within three months of that, I had my first book deal. And that was that, um, which book was that? Was so that, that was Cooking Boots. Cooking Boots so was, was your first. it was very much about, you know, a London girl about town. And, you know, I, I sort of was working in fashion and beauty then, so it was very much about, um, you know, or like what what to eat when you spent all your money on your Manolos or like what to eat when you're trying to impress a date. Oh, I love it. it. A really very, practical very, guide. You know, very yeah. much about mood and food. And um, it was so fun because I'd come from this, you know, magazine background, very visual background as well. So to be able to style the book and, um, you know, it was just so much fun to do. And then I think it was uh, some years after that, I was doing television and um, I I was uh, doing a sh TV show for Channel 4 and my co-host happened to be Jay Reno, who's incredible. And he's a mouth on legs and he, he would eat everything I made with such sort of enthusiasm and gusto. And I'd never really had a mentor before. And he just said to me, you really need to think about learning about the restaurant trade because your food is so idiosyncratic. I've never tasted these flavors together. You have a really good palate. Go and work in restaurants and go and learn. And I took him very seriously. So I did. I kind of went and started doing stages and working in people's kitchens. And it was really, really tough. Um, did you enjoy it? I really did. I really did. I think I really enjoyed knowing that I was part of doing something that's so transformative for somebody else you know you go into a restaurant you could be in a really bad mood but if you're served something really wonderful with warm hospitality it can really change your day or your week or your month and I love being part of that and then I sort of started doing pop-ups and that was like my first kind of high because I, I remember there was a chef called Anna Hansen from the Modern Pantry and she really gave me my first gig and said look I'm doing this thing it's a pop-up 90 people do you fancy taking over for a night I'd never cooked for more than 20 people and I went in it sounds terrifying <laughs> it was terrifying and she was such a great you know mentor and coach and she said you can do this you can do this and we're here to back you up and help but I remember doing my first service and it was like a drug. I mean, it was so the the high that you get, the adrenaline is so addictive, and just to see people smiling and really loving your food, it just I knew this was what I wanted to do. So I started, yeah, doing lots of pop ups and things, and then um, private catering as well. And a lot of my clients ended up being chefs who were having parties at home, really like well known chefs. So yeah. I was so flattered. Um, you know, I did the party for Brett from the Ledbury and, um, you know, his birthday party in his home and, you know, he's this incredibly talented chef and it was a real compliment to be asked to cook for his birthday. Um, and then I sort of continued and then there was a female food critic who had been following my career and one night I, I was doing a six week run at a hotel and she just took me aside and said, when are you going to stop being such a coward? And when are you going to commit to a space of your own? And I remember at that time feeling like this was some sort of Virginia Woolf-esque challenge <laughs> to find a space of my own. And I was also very tired of carrying all my things from one place to another. Yeah. And I thought, actually, it's been six years. I've birthed the idea of what I want my restaurant to look like, to feel like, what my philosophy is what I want to add to a neighborhood, to the world, to my community. Um, and I knew it was time. And then we spent two years looking for a site because I only wanted to open in Marylebone. Oh, really? And that was your chosen spot. It was, was a little like me with spot. Notting Hill. I, that was, I wanted to shop in Notting Hill. Yeah, it's a um, neighborhood, right? Yeah, you feel local. that. And I, for me, restaurants are very much about community. They're very much about neighborhoods. And I, I really felt that I wanted to have a place where... I really got to know the people who were coming in, that it wasn't transient, that people were coming in regularly, that I got to know their names, the names of their dogs and where they like to go on holiday, how they like to have their gin and tonic fixed, you know, all their quirks. 
and that's what Giacconi has become. And yeah, it's, it's like walking into a, a someone's drawing room, actually. It uh, really it's is. cozy, and you know, I try and do that here at Blink as well, where you know, everyone's invited. You bring your dogs in, you bring your babies in. Do you want a coffee? Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's nice, and it's so much. It's important because you know, shops are kind of dying, restaurants and services. Yeah, I think it's so important that I I think that. If you have a restaurant or a business or a retail, whatever it is, in a community that's doing something that's really positive, it actually bleeds into your community. So you're creating a stronger community just by being there and doing something positive. And for Nadim and I, my husband and I run the restaurant together, we, from the beginning, have, have really believe in the idea of positive business. And we're like, well... I think you can be so powerful as a restaurant, you know, you, you can have such impact. And if every single line of your P&L is doing something that is giving back or empowering someone, whether it's your suppliers or, um, you know, buying green energy or whatever it is, empowering your team, um, that's really important to us. Um, so, you know, over the years, we've really kind of focused on that. And I think the pandemic gave us a really good opportunity to look at our business and kind of go, where can we start, you know, improving and, and doing better things better. And um, we've become the first independent restaurant to become carbon neutral. That was really important to us because I grew up in Kenya, mm. watching rural communities and knowing that actually these people have the lowest carbon footprint in the world, yet they pay the price for our greedy consumption. So that was my, my, my way of balancing that in a way and trying to give back to those communities and, um, you know, doing great training with the team, healthcare for all of them, all these things, they, they, yeah. they mean so well, much. Well, you know, me. people often ask me, you know, what, what, what do you enjoy most about your business? And it, it, it is being able to do that, but also seeing people come in and really love what you do and feel part of yeah. uh, a community. I just think it's so important now and as a business to be able to, to give back and, and do what we can do. And the idea of purpose as well. I think, yeah. you know, when you have a mission and you will attract people who are who want to be part of that purpose yeah. and you're all looking the same direction and you all know that it's not just about clocking in clocking out you're actually doing something that is serving a purpose yeah and, and i think in your restaurant there is this wonderful discovery of um fusion food i love the fact that you are uh you know i don't know you seem to have one foot in in, in kenya uh another in india maybe another in um in in london but you know just you know, yesterday I was just leafing through Comfort and Joy, your latest book, and amazing all the ingredients that you bring, bring together. What, what If someone says, what cuisine do you do, do you, how would you describe it? Well, it's taken us a while to coin it, and it wasn't easy because it's, you know, sometimes so convenient to say, well, I do Italian food or I do Chinese mm. food or whatever it is. But we now say that we what we do is we cook, without borders, we cook immigrant food. And immigrant food is what happens when you have the ache and the longing for something that you've left behind, but equally the wonder of your new landscape. And when you reconcile those two things, you're creating something completely new. And I think that's what immigrant food is. I think it's your old traditions layered with the traditions of your new nation. And for me, I grew up in such a densely immigrant area and I'm so grateful for that. So I'm, my food and, and me myself, I am a product of East Africa, mm. of my Indian heritage, of being British, but then all those sort of, you know, little mini economies that, that sort of um, I shopped at, whether it was the Turkish supermarket or the Polish supermarket or the Iranian supermarket, they've all kind of bled into my, my cuisine and, and that's how I cook. And it does, it requires so much imagination to think about, you know, I, was, I just love some of your recipes like macaroni and saffron and, yeah. you know, you, you mix ingredients that I would never imagine you could mix and... I think that's the creativity in you as well coming out and it obviously you know touches the heart of so many people because Chikoni is just a roaring success. I think what makes me the happiest is when we have we're very I mean we have such an international community in Marylebone but when people I had I remember it was year two we had a table of 10 come in and there were people from Lebanon and people from Paris and people from Egypt 
and this real kind of international mix of very, very cool people. And at the end, I went to chat to them and every single one of them was saying, well, that tastes like something my grandmother used to cook. That tastes like something my aunt used to cook. And when people find home at Jikomi through the food, through the flavors, that makes me incredibly happy because I think sometimes as immigrants, you are particularly like for me, I'm, I'm Kenyan, but I'm Indian, but I'm British. And often people will only see the one thing and you're put into this little box and, you know, you're not meant to sway from that. And I think in a way, Jikoni was my subconscious answer to that. It was like, well, actually, I am all of these identities mm -hmm. and I want to be able to speak in many different tongues and showcase all of my, my multitude of identities. Yeah. And I can do that here through the food, through the culture I've created, um, through the languages we speak and I think that's what I love about hospitality as well that it is so international yeah and I think we're all uh, we're such a mishmash now we're much more complicated we're neither one thing nor another yeah. I, I know when I was growing up I wanted to be one thing or the other and now it's lovely to say actually I'm this whole mixture yeah. um, I'm, I'm Indian but I feel very British and so everything you say is so true but you know we were talking about our fathers and when I lost my father I ached for um, you know, mangoes and things that reminded me of him. And so food is so important as a kind of emotional memory as well. It becomes such a portal. And I think I remember writing when I was writing my last book, there was one essay in particular that had become so important to me because I think often cookery books are very much about sort of, you know, green lawns and white picket fences and food isn't that. Food is messy, it's complicated, it can be joyful but equally it can be painful too. And when I wrote, wrote this last essay, in the last book it was... Um, it was about a woman who has become a widow and her flashbacks to her last life and, uh, sorry, her, her, her life when she got married and, um, and, and the sort of politics of eating when you become a widow, what that means in our communities, what the judgment is, what, uh, what the expectations are. And I think it's really important to talk about those things, to own our narrative is, is, it's become so important because I think um, if we don't start telling our sto stories, then somebody else is going to tell them badly. And you do really tell it very beautifully through food and comfort and joy, which is your latest book. I was reading it as if I was reading fiction. It was beautiful where you describe your uh, grandfather's, um, is it Shamba? Yeah, 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 the Shamba. Uh, how he grew, you know, vegetables and how veg, you know, vegetables just come to life on your pages, which is, I, th I think, the point of the book to really celebrate vegetarian homely food but the way you describe it I, I think you said you convert the most unrepentant carnivore and I just thought yeah. it was brilliant because everything seems delicious and I love yeah. the fact you know onions have got silky jackets and yeah. uh, malachite you describe peas as sweet peas as malachite pearls and yeah butter as I think gold and um, anyways it's, it's absolutely beautiful but I just wondered why it was so important for you to um, really focus on just veg vegetarian food? Well, I think uh, it's actually how I eat a lot of the times. So I'd say I, I eat everything, but I'm 80% of the time I eat vegetarian food. It's how I was brought up. And I feel that for a lot of cultures, vegetables have always been the whole meal. And in the West, for a long time, vegetables were sort of very, the vegetarian option was very dour, it was very boring. And it's only now in the last 10 years that people are traveling, they're understanding vegetarian food better. You know, people like Yotam, Otelengi has, has made vegetarian food so delicious, um, so compelling. And I, I think over the pandemic was when I really started thinking about vegetables and, and my grandfather, especially in that relationship, the spiritual relationship he had with the land because we were all going through so much at that time. And um, we took about two weeks off initially because uh, the government had mandated closures. And then I remember thinking, well, actually, hospitality doesn't just stop because the government tells us to shut our doors. And 
we like so many other people in our industry felt that we had a perfectly good kitchen and that it should be put to use so my husband and I started going in and a friend of mine was a doctor at um, King's College Hospital and he'd been telling us how how much they were struggling so we started cooking 60 meals a day for um, King's College Hospital and then as that sort of uh, I remember saying to my husband at the time you know all people need right now is comfort and joy and we'd also realized that you know hospitals are such international spaces yet you go to the canteen you get fish and chips or a bad <laughs> sandwich and it felt so unfair for all those people that were working 13 14 hours a day who were away from their families who needed comfort to not have a taste of home so we were cooking these very international meals um, you know, one day an Egyptian speciality, something, you know, Asian or Indian or whatever it was. And they went down so well. So then when we um, we were allowed to start cooking again, um, you know, although restaurants were still closed, we decided to launch a delivery service called Comfort and Joy. And it was vegetarian. And again, very much inspired by my grandfather. And he was this man who had come from such scarcity. You know, he ran away from Punjab, ended up in Bombay, got on a ship, T took this voyage in the dark to Kenya, not knowing anyone, not knowing what he was going to find. And he arrived in Kenya at a time when England was then still a British colony. There were racial barriers, language barriers, all these divides. And yet he still found time to fall so deeply in love with this beautiful red volcanic soil that just seemed so benevolent. And for someone who'd come for, from, from so little, this just seemed like a miracle to him. And I think he never stopped this feeling or this sense of gratitude for the soil and for, for what came from it. And he would say to us that, you know, these, uh, whatever it is, an onion, a courgette, this is a miracle because this has withstood pest, blight, bad weather. Yet it comes to our table. We can cook with it. We can share what we've cooked with those we love. And that is a miracle and I think we've become so disassociated from where our food comes from and and what it takes to grow it and I really wanted to celebrate that message of comfort of joy of abundance of plenty and um, yeah I think the vegetable kingdom deserves to be celebrated well I, I have to say there were some recipes in there that I just thought right you know I, I'm dying to try and you know you've got you know avocado hummus all, all sorts of things that I just think you've just the, the blend of ingredients and ideas from different countries is, um, I mean, it's just so beautiful to read, let alone to uh, try and cook, which I'm definitely going to do. Uh, but, you know, it's a perfect segue because I also want to ask you about beauty um, yeah. and how you feel food and beauty work together. You were a beauty writer. Yes. Um, I thought it was really interesting reading about your relationship with bread. And I could so relate to it yeah. um, and how you, you, I just thought it'd be lovely if you could just talk us through that challenge of kind of that love-hate kind of relationship. Yeah, well, it's very much love now, but yeah. it wasn't for a long time. So it was, um, you know, I'd grown up in a very traditional Punjabi family. We didn't have a lot of freedom. And I remember going to university when I was 18 and kind of going crazy because it was the first time I had any sort of autonomy. Um, but some of the choices I made for myself weren't particularly healthy ones. And uh, one of those was that I was approached by a photographer to model for this magazine. And uh, it was a, r a real moment of vanity. Anyway, I was on the shoot and I was tiny. I mean, I was 20 years, 19 years old, um, still growing into my body, really. And I remember overhearing him tell the makeup artist that I was photographically fat. And it was like this era of the Atkins was just kind of, you know, really mm -hmm. hotting up. Yeah. And I just remember going home and feeling such self-hatred and such disappointment at this body that had seemingly let me down. And, you know, eating rotis or chapatis or parathas, pizzas, bagels, croissants had been sort of this kind of circular, circular everyday, you know, the dream of everyday life. You just do it. You know, it's just kind of you don't even think about it. And then overnight, suddenly all these things, all carbs, but particularly bread had become the enemy. 
and I remember going into um, bakeries and, you know, sniffing this, this sort of yeast and delicious smells of baking. And not you've actually said anything. that the more you're told you shouldn't have something, the more you really want you something. You really want it. Yeah. And I, I guess I must have been a masochist because I still frequented bakeries, but I just wouldn't allow myself to eat any of it. And then it was some years later when I was doing um, a, a journalism course and I was sent on a, a sort of you know project where I um, ended up at this amazing house. It was... Um, it was a house that housed refugee women, asylum seekers, and they were from all over the world. And they were all cooking together and there was these sort of pots of stews and curries bubbling away. But more than anything, there was this sort of multi-ethnic kind of feast of bread and breads that I'd never seen before. And I remember this one woman in particular, I think she gave me the most sage advice anyone's ever given me. She just said, in, she, she filled up my plate with bread and she just said, in our language, in my language, we have the same word for bread as we do for life because bread is life and what is life without bread? <laughs> and I just started eating all this bread and I haven't stopped since. And it was just this really beautiful moment that kind of puts things into perspective. Yeah, yeah. Why well, just enjoy, don't deny yourself and you know so, yeah, I think balance is key, but I, I love your description of that. And and I think also in you know I think cooking and when you're making things from scratch, when you know everything that's going yeah. into it, it's much better than buying things that are ready made. You don't know the kind of, you know, ultra processed things that might be going into whatever you're buying. So there's a whole chapter on bread and pancakes, which are life's great joys and, you know, in, in the book. But um, I think in these, in these political times and it's very difficult times that we're living through right now where we seem to have very little control about what's going on in the world and our choices are being taken away from us to be to be able to cook is actually a really great way of taking control of your own life your destiny your health it's an activism in itself because it's about self-care i think it's really important yeah no, definitely. And I mean, do you, do you have much time for self-care? Or you just, because you've, you've really got a very busy life. Um, I, I follow you on it. Instagram and I just think, wow. <laughs> uh, because, you know, when, you talk, when you're writing and then you decide you're going to open up a restaurant, opening a restaurant, as I know, running a business is a whole different yeah, kettle of fish. Yeah, it's all consuming. Um, you always look amazing. And I'm, I put on my lovely floral silk dress to <laughs> try and keep up with one of Ravinda's beautiful, beautiful dresses. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, how... How do you find the time? Because you always look incredible. I mean, where does... Um, I think you just have to make the time. I'd love to have more time. I have to say that when I think back to my 20s and I I think, God, I, I used to say I was busy then. I had no clue whatsoever. Um, but it's about making time and having little rituals, you know, little things yeah. that you do, um, you know, getting enough sleep. It, I struggle with, but, you know, that's kind of one thing. Eating well, I think making time to eat well, eat breakfast. I never used to eat breakfast for years and years and years. And now that's become a ritual. You know, I will always have my breakfast in the morning and um, set myself up for the day. I think it's just about routines, really. And I think then, you're right. So it's, it's habitual rather yeah. than even if it's, I might get a facial once a month, yeah. maybe. Uh, yeah. I don't and I should should but it is if you put it in your diary or if you like every Sunday evening is always my time for yeah. you know maybe face mask or brow mask. It. So I think the weekends are of exactly that Sunday for me is a day where I really kind of try and give myself I'm mean, often on you writing deadlines <laughs> yeah but nails or I might go and get my nails done or um, I might oil my hair mm. or um, I love love having a bath you know, lighting a candle, all those things that make you feel kind of cosseted in a way, in a yeah. sort of little bubble. I think that's what's lovely. Well, I love Sundays. the fact you talk about oiling hair because that for me was always a real Sunday thing where my mother would oil my hair. Yeah. Uh, and I would complain because she's mustard oil then, which <laughs> used to sting my eyes. So, um, but it's still so important. I try and do my girls um, hair and they keep complaining and saying no the oil stays in it won't come out but yeah it's so important it's so nice and to when you wash it in the morning it just feels so soft yeah, and gorgeous exactly. 
It's uh, I sleep with it overnight. I just yeah. put it in my hair and and just sleep with it overnight. And it's just nice to have time for that little treatment. You know, once a week, I think it's good. Yeah. And maybe not put too much so that it stays. The residue <laughs> stays. And what about your brows? Because we have to go into brows. Because I think you've got great brows. You were Thank just you. asking me about microblading, and I was saying. You know, it can enhance back chat, I think you need to. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good to know. I didn't really know what microblading is, so thank you for explaining it. But, I mean, my brows, I get them done maybe, um, you know, once a fortnight. I go to yeah. Bharti at Selfridges, who's always so great and never hurts me. Um, I, um, I fill them in a little bit if I need to, but generally I just... Yeah. Well, you were saying, which was quite interesting, that you um, you feel that you didn't have you had a brow thread um, a while ago, maybe in your twenties, which you felt too much was taken off. Yeah. And you you sort of since then feel that you've been growing them back to their yeah, sort of yeah yeah yeah. I like glory. them. I'm always very nervous whenever I have someone new. I'm always like, don't take too much off because yes. I've had that done before. I think, you know, brows should you shouldn't veer too far from your natural brow shape yeah. I think that's a lot a mistake a lot of people make they might look at a celebrity who has an amazing arch and be like oh I want that but what suits someone else's face might not suit yours and I think you kind of you don't want to veer too far off your shape and I think that's a mistake I made because I think this woman tried to give me these like arches and took quite a, quite a lot yeah. off so it's never quite grown back in the same way, but, you know. I think eyebrows are so precious and people, especially in your youth, you don't realise that they, they kind of, it's not that they stop growing, but they become sparser. Yeah. So just treasure them and keep them as full as possible. Yeah, so. I know. I love a full brow. Yeah. You know, the fuller the better. Well, yours look great. And and so what's next? You were, you were saying that maybe fiction, and I was thinking I would actually love you to write a book on beauty. Could you do that? Oh, my God, that would be going, <laughs> going back, back to your early days. Going back to my early days. I was trying to think, you know, how you would describe eyebrows in your sort of poetic, romantic way, and I just thought, God, I, I would just love to see that on a page. Well, eyebrows are so expressive, aren't they? Especially in our culture. Like, you see all these beautiful actresses, like the dancers, um, my niece has done Kathak and another niece does Bharatanatyam and the way they move their brows, yes. it's just beautiful. I know. And actually, if you look at brows through the ages and with different cultures, they say so much about women. Um, yeah. All the time. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Right. I'm hugging your book, which I love, and I can't wait to delve in. Um, I want to ask you some quick fire questions. Okay. A courgette or an aubergine? An aubergine. It's the king of vegetables. Oh, everybody loves aubergines. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, it's not my favourite, actually. I prefer courgette, but um, I also love the way you describe how um, you char grill an aubergine and it sort of falls into itself. It collapses in on itself, yeah. And if you've got, you know, particularly not now, because obviously the weather's changed, but when you have barbecues, I just throw them onto the barbecue and they go really kind of, you know, the skin gets really burnt and they've collapsed in on themselves. And then to make something like a baba ganoush, but you know, you can do the same with uh, courgettes too. So you can make something like a baba ganoush. In fact, there's a recipe in the book um, where you basically char the, the courgettes completely and then scoop them in mixed with tahini and we do it with um, a bit of mint, a tiny bit of cardamom, just a little hint um, and then serve with sort of fried capers and oh my yeah, God. okay delicious. that sounds delicious yeah. so I'm gonna look that one up. Um, this is gonna be a hard one for you, Mumbai or Nairobi? Oh for different things, different cities for different things. I think Nairobi for sort of nostalgia and connecting with my past and memories of my grandfather and my happy times as a childhood and Mumbai for shopping which I love <laughs> doing definitely um, yes and you know great eating there's a I love thalis so there's a place called Sri Thakkar Bojanlali which I absolutely adore and love what they do they are Marwari and they make vegetarian food and the last time I was there it was mango season and it, everything on the thali was created with mangoes both savory and sweet and they cook a lot with ancient grains so they make all their breads they mill the flour themselves and then they make these fantastic breads which just well, I'll delicious. definitely be visiting my next trip. Mm. Uh, and looking at you, this might be another hard question. Mascara or lipstick? Mascara. 
Oh, with. really? I'm because you always have beautiful about. shades of lipstick on. I, uh, I love, summer. yeah, I love lashes. Ah, okay. Well, I have to say, Rinda, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could sit and chat to you forever. Me too. Uh, and I'm, as I said, I'm so delighted to have met you. And thank you for making time to come. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.